Hi, my name is Connie Kuklanis and you're watching the video Deviation in Incombinance to Business. In this video, we'll be discussing the features of the deviation in patients with neurogenic palsies or mechanical restrictions. Okay, now in incompetence to business, we have now a distinction between what we consider the primary deviation and the secondary deviation. So depending on which eye is fixing, there is a difference in the deviation we see. Now you've already studied concomitant strabismus and in concomitant strabismus, we didn't really feature or discuss um, primary and secondary deviations because we know that with concomitancy, the deviation is the same no matter which eye is fixing. So with incompetent strabismus, the primary deviation is the deviation when the patient is fixing with the unaffected or sound eye. So obviously in this instance, if you had, for instance, a left superior oblique palsy, if the patient was fixing with the right eye, the unaffected eye, this is the instance where you're looking at the primary deviation. However, if you have the patient fixing with the left eye, the affected eye, you now have the secondary deviation. And if we look at the image over here, what we see is that the primary deviation, so in this instance, um, we have a patient who has a right affected eye and the patient is fixing with the left eye. Um, we can see that the ESO deviation here is much smaller than the ESO deviation when the patient is made to fix with the right eye, the affected eye. Now, why is it that there is an increase in the size of the deviation when the patient fixes with the affected eye? Let's take an example of a right lateral rectus palsy. So in this particular image, if we had a right lateral rectus palsy, if the patient was asked to fix with that right eye, the affected eye, what would have to happen is that in order for the eye to AB duct to come into primary position, excessive amounts of innervation will need to go to that affected muscle. And as such, as excessive amounts of innervation go to the lateral rectus, they will do the same to the uh, synergist, the medial rectus of the other eye. And therefore what we end up seeing is a larger deviation once the patient is fixing with the affected eye. The more recent the deviation, the more distinction you'll see between the primary and secondary deviation. Uh, the more long-standing the deviation becomes, the more concomitancy we see and less difference between the primary and secondary deviation. Another feature to think about is that the deviation in primary position may alter dependent on whether a abnormal head posture or compensatory head posture is present. So if we look at the um, patient over here to the, to the right, the patient is tilting their head to the right. And when we take a closer look at the eyes with the abnormal head posture, we can see that there's very little deviation in that position as compared to when the patient is in primary position, we can see that there is certainly a vertical deviation and in this instance, a left hypertropia. We'll talk more about abnormal head postures and what drives an abnormal head posture in a later video. But clearly what you can see here is that the patient is tilting their head to achieve BSV. Another important feature to be aware of in relation to neurogenic palsies is that the eye will be deviated in prior position opposite to the action of the palsied muscle. Now, what does this mean? What it means is that if, for instance, the AV ductor is palsied, so the lateral rectus, the eye will be adducted in primary position. So an eye that's adducted means an esotropic eye. And this is because if your lateral rectus is palsied, the ipsilateral antagonist remains unopposed. And therefore, you'll see that with a lateral rectus palsied, the ipsilateral antagonist, the medial rectus, will adduct the eye further and we'll see an esotropia. Let's do a more complicated example, a left superior oblique palsy. So the first thing to think about is what is the action of that particular muscle? And the action of that particular muscle is that it causes depression, abduction, and in cycle rotation of the eye. OK, 
okay? So we now should see a deviation that represents the opposite of the action of the extraocular muscles. So what deviation do we expect? Well, we expect that the eye will be elevated because the superior oblique is a depressor. We expect that the eye will be adducted because the superior oblique is an abductor. And we expect that the eye will be excyclo rotated because the superior oblique is an encyclo rotator. So what does this mean for the cover test? Well, what we'll see is a left esotropia with a left on right or a left hypertropia. Now on cover test, generally you won't see the um, excyclo rotation, so I've not documented that here. Okay, so this is generally what we expect to see. Now, not all patients will always present to you with this textbook deviation, but it's important to be aware of the principles behind what to expect in primary position. Now, moving on to what do we expect to see of the deviation when we move the patient into different positions of gaze? Well, generally with a neurogenic palsy, what we expect to see is that the deviation will be greatest in the direction of action of the affected, affected muscle, and then it will be least in the direction directly away or in the opposite um, field of action of the affected muscle. So if we have a look here at the um, patient to the right, what we can see is that in primary position, we can see that there is an ESO deviation. We move the patient into right gaze, we see a minus four abduction of the right eye. And if we were to measure the deviation here, we would note that there would be an increase in the size of the ESO deviation. And then if we have a look over into left gaze, we can see that there is very little deviation there. And if we were to measure it, perhaps we'd either see that the patient um, has no manifest deviation or has very little, um, uh, a little amount of ET in that position. So we have a distinctly different size deviation in each position. And in this image, what we see is the deviation is greatest in the direction of action of the affected muscle. So where the lateral rectus or the right lateral rectus is working and least in the directly um, opposite position <clears throat> to the field of action of the affected muscle, which in this instance is left gaze. Let's do an example of a vertical muscle. Let's say we had a palsy of the left superior oblique. Now, the left superior oblique's field of action is in dextro depression, so in right gaze and down. And so what we would expect is that the deviation would be greatest in this position, however, would be least in the opposite direction, which is lavo elevation, so left and up gaze. Okay, moving on to mechanical restrictions. The deviation in prior position can be different to that of what we expect to see in neurogenic palsy. So in neurogenic palsy, we've already discussed that if you work out which is the affected muscle, generally the deviation will be in the opposite direction to the action of that muscle. Now for mechanical restrictions, we may not see that. And generally you may see very little um, a very little deviation or no deviation in prior position, despite marked limitations of eye movement. So say for instance, you have marked limitation of elevation, um, as we do in the example to the right, we can see here that the patient has marked limitation of the right eye, it's not going past midline, yet what we see in prior position is very little deviation. On the other hand, uh, for neurogenic palsy, the deviation in prior position is relative to the extent of the palsy. So the greater the extent, um, the larger the deviation. So the deviation in prior position will be greater for a minus four limitation as compared to a minus one limitation. And again, if we have a look at the image here of a patient with a neurogenic palsy, we can see that there's an obvious esotropia that is relative to the um, deviation Sorry, that is relative to the limitation we see of the right eye. Another aspect of mechanical restrictions to be aware of is that mechanical restrictions can often cause reversal of the deviation. And what we mean by reversal is you'll see an actual uh, reversal of the direction of the deviation. So say you had a right hyper deviation, you can see that change to a right hypo deviation in a specific position of gaze. 
let's have a look at the deviation or the patient here to the to the right. What we see is in primary position it looks relatively straight, and as we as the patient looks up, we have limited elevation of the right eye, and what we see is a left on right. And then if we take the patient into down gaze, we see there's limitation of the right eye um, in down gaze, and we see reversal of height. We now see a right on left. Now this theoretically defies Herring's law and Sherrington's law, so what we're seeing is usually a mechanical restriction in these particular instances. Just be aware though that there are several instances where the patient may have a neurogenic palsy and you'll see reversal of height. We'll talk more about these as we actually look specifically at um, different types of neurogenic palsies. But some examples of these are bilateral superioblic palsies, for instance, will cause reversal of height and a third nerve palsy can do this also. So in summary, some key features that we'll observe in patients with neurogenic palsies is that secondary deviation will be greater than the primary deviation. Deviation will be greatest in the direction of action of the palsy muscle. And the deviation in primary position is generally opposite to the action of the palsy muscle. Okay, and for mechanical restrictions, um, two main things um, that distinguish a mechanical restriction from a neurogene palsy is that you may see very little deviation in primary position and there may be no relationship between the amount of a limitation that you see and the deviation that you see in primary position and also that um, mechanical restrictions are likely or more likely to cause a reversal of the deviation. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.